I probably screwed that up. I'm sorry. <laughs> what's up? What's happening? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Animation Station. You want to start us just ranting and everything animation? Except sometimes when we jump into live action, as we are this month when we're talking about Power Rangers. Now, this sounds stupid. I know, like, you're an animation-only channel. Why are you doing this show, of all things? A, though it's intended to be a kid's show, so it's fair game for this channel. B, I already announced it last month that this was going to be, well, last year, sorry, last year that we were doing this as a tribute to the Fallen Rangers that we've lost over the years, more specifically JDF. Rest in peace, man. This one's for you. And because I just love Power Rangers and I really want to talk about it. And no, it's not going on both channels. That feels kind of useless. Not to mention, I have a whole other different thing for me on that channel. So this is Animation Station exclusive. And since I don't jump into live action that often on this channel, at least not usually, I thought it'd be fair game to just do this. So let's get started, shall we? Let's start, with, of course, with the original Mighty Morphin. I'm going to be discussing all three seasons of the show, as well as the movie, which I do have a physical copy of. And you guys know, I only pick up physical copies if I think they're worth watching. Or just because they're so hilarious that they just need to be seen. So, yeah, I'll talk more about that later. But let's go ahead and get this started. Um, there's not really going to be any pictures in this one. This is more of a discussion format, and that's also why you're seeing me in live action. So, without further ado, let's begin. Let's start off with the cast of the show, starting with the main rangers. First up is Kimberly, played by Amy Jo Johnson, the first pink ranger. Next is Trini, played by the late, great... Thuy... Thuy Trang? I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Then there's Zack, played by Walter Jones, one of my personal favorite rangers because of his whole dance quando kind of thing. Then there's Billy, played by David Yost, who was a closet at the time, but has since come out. And good for him. And then, of course, there's the first Red Ranger, Jason, played by Austin St. John. And yes, I know the whole thing going on with Austin St. John right now, that he might be going to prison or whatever, but... I'm trying to keep this lighthearted and fun, okay? I'm keeping that crap out of here. I'm only going to mention it. I'm not going to go into detail about it, because it's not worth it. I'm trying to keep this upbeat and positive. And then, of course, there's Tommy Oliver, played by the late, great, amazing, arguably greatest Power Ranger of the entire franchise, Jason David Frank. He loved being a Power Ranger. He loved this role. And, yeah, he had a bit of a rivalry going on with Austin St. John. Both of them had egos or some other stuff. It's a bunch of behind-the-scenes crud I'm not getting into. But, yeah, that's your original six. You had Kimberly, Trini, Zach, Billy, Jason, and Tommy. And, of course, Tommy starts out evil, as I'll elaborate on later. And then, that's your main Ranger cast from Season 1 all the way up to the first half of Season 2. When you get to that point, then you start having some new people brought in because of the peace conference and because of behind the scenes stuff that apparently was a pay dispute that led to three of the rangers deciding to leave. So the three decided to leave, if you didn't already know, were Trini, Zach, and Jason. Because like I said, it was a behind the scenes pay dispute. I'm not going to say anything more about it because like I said, I'm trying to keep this lighthearted and fun until I get to the bad seasons when I rip it apart. Um, so, from the second half of Season 2 all the way up to Season 3, we had Aisha as the new Yellow Ranger, played by Karen Ashley. We had Adam, the new Black Ranger, played by Johnny Young Bosch. Yes, that's Johnny Young Bosch, the one that's the voice of Yu, uh, Yu Yu Hakusho. He's the new voice of Broly. He's pretty much more known for his anime dub filmography. 
which is quite extensive. Seriously, go look it up if you haven't already. He is a very talented actor, and honestly, I kind of like Adam a bit more than Zack. That's just my thing. And then, of course, the big, the probably the biggest change of the three was that there was a new Red Ranger. Instead of Jason, now we had Rocky, who's played by Steve Cardenas, who is also very thankful of being a ranger, and from what I've seen behind the scenes from interviews and panels and especially his little guest episode of Completionist on the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers SNES game, he seems like an all-around great guy, so... Yeah. Um, Rocky, I never liked more than Jason. He did seem a bit more on the bland side, but Steve does a good job acting, and I wish him... I give him nothing but credit for everything he had to do. And then in Season 3, we got an, the final cast shift before it straight up shifted into a whole new team. And that is Catherine, played by Catherine Sutherland. Or Cat, as a lot of people call her. And just like Tommy, she starts out evil as this cat who can shift into human and works for Rita Repulsa. And then later on, ends up starting becoming good, ends up saving Kimberly, and becomes the new Pink Ranger when Kimberly decides to leave to focus on her career in gymnastics. Thank you to Linkara for giving me that quick brief explanation. And speaking of Linkara, no, this is not a ripoff of his Atop the Fourth Wall History of Power Rangers series. This is just my thing to share the information with you guys. I'm not trying to rip off Linkara. I'm not trying to discredit Linkara. Seriously, if you want a super analytical version of this, go watch his Atop the Fourth Wall series. I will leave the playlist in the description and all the props to him in the world. And also, like I said, since you guys know that you're that I'm going to too many games this year, and Linkar is going to be there. Might get him in a future video. Who knows? That'd be pretty cool. But we'll wait and see. I'm not going to push it. But yeah, that's your main Rangers, and the cast shift that happened halfway through the season. Moving on to the supporting cast. And uh, it's not very extensive. It's mostly a bunch of extras, and then these are the ones that are the most significant. First up is Ernie, played by Richard Janelle, and he would go on to play the character all the way up through, I believe, Zio? Because I believe in Turbo, it's when the juice bar shifts over to Lieutenant Stone's uh, ownership, which, according to behind-the-scenes stuff, Richard left on health concerns. That's understandable. But Ernie was a really nice guy. He was kind of like a secondary mentor for the Rangers, and more helped them with the human stuff, while Zordon helped them with the Power Ranger stuff. Even though, that's how I remember it. I could be wrong, though. That's just the way I remember it. But Ernie was a cool character. Then, of course, there's Bulk and Skull, the most recurring, longest-running, consistent characters in the entire Power Rangers series, aside from Tommy himself, played by Paul Schreier and Jason Norby. They start out as one-dimensional bullies, and then later on start developing into... Really fascinating, interesting characters, like when they go to the police academy, then they join the Ten Stones police force, they're turned into monkeys for some reason, they get turned invisible, and they last through a bunch of seasons of the show. They last through Mighty Morphin, they last through Alien, they last through Zeo, they last through Turbo, they last through In Space, uh, they have a bulk hence a cameo in Lost Galaxy, and then they wouldn't come back until Samurai. When it's more just bulk training Skull's son. Yeah, it's complicated. I'll talk more about it when we get to Samurai. And then, of course, Bulk himself got to be a Power Ranger in the internet series Hyper Force, but I don't really count that as a Power Ranger season because it's more of an online web show that plays out like a role playing game. It is interesting, though. Definitely go check it out. It's a very unique kind of experience for Power Ranger fans. And of course, yeah, Bulk and Skull are fan favorite characters. Not really much more to say there. I'll elaborate more on their characters as we get through each season, but trust me, even in this first series, they're still very good. Then of course we have Zordon, played by David J. Fielding, 
well, voiced by David J. Fielding. Yes, I know there's technically two actors for some of these other characters. Like, for example, Zed's played by a guy in a suit, but then voiced by a completely different guy. Like, I understand that. I just credit the voices mostly because that's the one that people like to focus on. But I do give props to the people in the suits that aren't actually voicing the characters. All right. There's, there's the recognition. But yeah, Zordon is the original mentor, and he would last all the way up until in space when, um, yeah, I'll get to that later. Then we have Alpha, voiced by Richard Stephen Horvitz. He would also last for a pretty long time. I believe he lasts all the way up until Lost Galaxy, I believe, because he's not in Time Force, so. He's not in Time Force, he's not in light speed, so. Yeah, I think he lasts all the way up until Lost Galaxy. And then, of course, he comes back in the Netflix special I'll talk about later. But, yeah. Alpha's voice is iconic. He's a bit of a bumbling buffoon, but you can't help but love him, and he is very essential in helping the Rangers out. So, yeah. Definitely really like Alpha. And then for the uh, more near side characters, but do recur most of the time, there's Miss Appleby, played by Royce Heron. Uh, she's the teacher that kind of shows up the most during the show. Kind of. It's it's very confusing. And then, of course, there's Ninjor in Season 3, when they get to the powers. And he's voiced by Dudley Do-Right. Interesting choice, and his voice takes some getting used to. But Ninjor's a cool character, and he definitely helps the Rangers out. So He's a cool character. I like Ninjor. And he has a very unique and interesting design as well. Oh, yeah, and speaking of designs, I guess I should talk about the designs of the Rangers. Um, <laughs> my bad. Um, what do I think of the designs of these first Power Rangers? They're simple, but they're iconic. You have the diamond patterns across the chest. You have the diamond patterns that go onto the gloves. You have a nice contrast of mostly red and of white with their corresponding colors. And then the helmets are really cool design, kind of modeled after each animal that they represent. Like, for example... The Red Ranger, it's a Tyrannosaurus Rex, so it has, like, what looks like teeth on this silver lining in his vi on his visor. Um, yes, the silver molded mouth thing is definitely bizarre, but it's low budget. I'm willing to give it a bit of a pass. And then, of course, there's the Green Ranger and the White Ranger. Two of the coolest designs in the whole show. Yes, I know that the... Green Ranger's shield was made out of cheap cloth, which, yeah, that, that sucks, but outside of the material, it's still really cool. He gets this cool shield, which later ends up becoming kind of like the first ever power-up slash battleizer of the entire series, which I'll get more into later, but it's interesting and it's really cool. And then, of course, there's the White Ranger with all the gold accents and the black and gold vest and the really cool design helmet, not to mention, I believe it's the only helmet out of all the Rangers that doesn't have that weird lip thing. It just has a flat silver mouthpiece, which is interesting. If I'd say which ones are probably my favorite, I would definitely say the White Ranger is the best one. It's just the most intricate, the most well-designed, and not to mention, like I said, it doesn't have that weird molded mouth thing. And then, of course, there's the Red Ranger. He's the most iconic. He's literally the face of the whole franchise, even today. So, yeah, I gotta give him the respect he's due. I do really like the Green Ranger. I just really wish that they found a better uh, material to make his dragon shield out of. Because according to Linkar's video, apparently in the original Super Sentai, it was made out of rubber and looked a lot better. But, yeah. Those are my personal three favorites. And then... I like the Black Rangers design as well. It's pretty interesting. But the the eyes on the top being such a you know, a blatant yellow and the only yellow part of the whole helmet definitely is a bit off putting, but that's really just my own little nitpick. Um I'd probably give the all these designs together a seven and then just a straight up ten for just the White Ranger, because they're iconic, you give them respect, they're simple. But they work, they do the job, and they do look pretty cool. And not to mention, it is nostalgic every time they come back in the series. Even if it's in a very bad episode. <laughs> like a battle. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry, that was uncalled for. But, yeah. 
So, yeah, that's my thoughts on the designs. They're simple, but they work, and they're pretty cool. That's enough of that. Now let's move on to the villains. Um, I may or may not miss a few because some of them are just barely in the show at all. And I'm not talking about, like, the monster of the week villains. I'm talking more about just the overall villains that we see hanging around the hideout. It's not that I don't like the monster of the week villains. It's just that it would take forever to discuss every single one of them. Like the pumpkin wrapper or pudgy pig or, you know, stuff like that. So... And because I don't want these videos to be an hour long, I, I came up with a solution of just talking about the main ones we see walking around the hideout or see the most frequently throughout the show. So with that said, let's get into it. First up, of course, is Rita Repulsa, the first ever villain in Power Rangers, and a pretty good one. The voice takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you're used to it, it's funny, not to mention... Barbara Goodson, her actress, does a great job just being super hammy. Like, it's so cool. And I believe she comes back to voice Robo Rita in Once and Always. So, yeah, that's that's something. Then we have Lord Zed. Um, which is weird because, again, like I said, some of these guys, they're played by guys in suits. And then they're voiced by a completely different person. In the suit, it's a guy called Ed Neal. And he does a good job with the mannerisms of the Lord Zed, not to mention Lord Zed's design. Part of my language here, for lack of a better term, bad ass. Like, all the muscle, the tubes, the exposed brain, the crown, that freaking staff. Like, it's Lord Zed. And then, of course, the red, vi the red visor and the grates over the mouth. Like, it's Lord Zed. It's self-explanatory. He's one of the coolest villains ever designed in the show. And yes, I will fight you on that. And then in voice, he's voiced by... Robert Axelrod. And Robert Axelrod's voice of Zed is pretty cool. Like, very, very cool. It, it's menacing. It feels monstrous. It's just a really dang good voice. I love the voice of Lord Zed. That goes well with his iconic monstrous design so yeah that's my thoughts on lord zed then we have rito revolto who's played by danny wayne um he starts out pretty intimidating starts out pretty scary a lot like lord zed and then later on just becomes kind of a bit of a comic relief character which is then later emphasized in his later appearance in the alien rangers and i believe also in zeo but i'm not entirely sure i'm pretty sure in zeo that's where that becomes a thing. And then, of course, there's Goldor, Rita, uh, Rita's original right-hand man. Second-in-command right-hand man, whatever you want to call it. And he's played by Kerrigan Mahan. Uh, the voice takes some getting used to, absolutely. And, yes, having a flying monkey eat a witch is uh, a bit too simple and too blatant rip-off of Wizard of Oz, but... If you take that away, Godar's still cool, he's still a cool design, and he is pretty effective. Until, just like Rito, he becomes a punching bag, which, yeah, I hate it when they do that. And then, of course, there's Scorpina, played by Wendy Lee. Um, she's barely there, barely even worth mentioning, so let's move on. Then there's, then there's a Snizzer and Squat, which I believe are the two comic relief characters. And they're played by Bob Peppenbrook and Michael Sorek. Um, they're fine, they work as comic relief, but they're more just extra monsters filling in the background at Rita's hideout. Then there's Master Vile, voiced by Simon Prescott. Um, he's cool, he's a very cool design, but we don't really see much of him, so I can't really say more about him until later, because I feel like the more significant times we see him are in later seasons like Zeo, and especially in space, so... Yeah. And then, of course, we have the uh, foot soldiers of each one. We have the putties, which are really cool designs, very effective, very simple, but they're really cool. I especially love the way the face is designed. Then, of course, there's the Z putties, which are the stronger putties made by Lord Zed, which have this Z on their chest, which ends up becoming a bit of a Achilles heel because if the rangers punch it, like, really hard, they just explode in glorious, dated, but... Very fascinating stop motion. 
And then the last notable villain I can think of off the top of my head is, of course, the evil Zord Serpentera. Which would later come back in Wild Force. So, yep, that's the villains. Next, let's move on to the Ranger colors. And yes, I know this sounds like a stupid thing to analyze, but... Here's the thing, guys. With almost every season of Power Rangers, the colors do end up shifting. Like, for example, sometimes we have a Black Ranger, and then other times we have a Green Ranger. Like, that's a pretty common swap. And then, of course, you have your six Rangers being gold or titanium or something like that. So, I just thought it'd be interesting to point, uh, quickly point them out. Uh, and for this first Mighty Morphin, you have red, blue, black, yellow, pink, green, and white. Pretty simple colors. So, yep, that's all I'm going to say about that. Let's move on. Next up is the Battleizers, or the power-ups of the season, which would later become a mainstay and actually straight up called Battleizers in the later seasons like Wild Force and Ninja Storm and Dino Thunder and SPD, stuff like that, where they're straight up called Battleizers. So I'm just going to call them Battleizers to keep them all in the same category. First up is the Dragon Shield, which is usually just on the Green Ranger, but at times he does transfer it to the other Rangers, like for example... The one time he transferred it to Zack to help him fight a monster, or the one time that Jason got to wear it. And the cool thing about when Jason got to wear it is he got to wield both the Power Sword and the Dragon Dagger. That's just cool. Then, of course, in Season 3, we have the Ninja Suits, which are bizarre, but they kind of work. Like It's kind of like an in-between thing between their full morph and... Morph? Full morph in their normal base form. Like, it's a nice little uh, in-between. And it's really cool, and not to mention, it's ninjas. It's a bit hard to screw that up. And then, of course, we have the stupidest thing ever invented in the entire series, in this point. Metallic armor. Now, this sounds cool in concept. The only problem is... It's glitter. Who or why came up with that idea, I have no idea, but it's stupid, and it looks just as stupid as you imagine it being. Like, seriously, the metallic armor is just stupid, and thankfully they do away with it pretty quickly, so. Yeah, screw the metallic armor, it's a piece of crap. Next up, let's move on to the Zords. There's a good number of these, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the normal Zords first, and then I'll talk about the Mega Zords next, afterwards making it a bit easier to quantify. And don't worry, like I said, this is the longest video of this entire series because from here on out, the longest each season gets is two. And even then, that's not until the Nickelodeon era where we get like Samurai and Super Samurai or Dino Charge and Dino Super Charge. And then later on, they just straight up turn to two seasons each for the series like with Dino Fury and Beast Morphers, so... Yeah, this is the longest video you're going to get in the whole analysis, so don't worry. After this, it's going to be a lot shorter, especially next time when we talk about Alien Rangers, which I know shouldn't be counted as its own season, but you know what? It gets its own separate DVD release. A lot of people pretty much think of it as a separate season because it's a whole new team of Rangers, so you know what? Screw it. I'm counting it as its own season and doing it tomorrow, not to mention... I'm already covering the first three seasons, and the movie, and the Netflix special. I'm already talking about the biggest majority of this franchise, so... Come on guys, give me a little bit of levity here. Okay, with that little rant done, let's move on to the Zords themselves. Let's start, of course, with the original six. There's, of course, the Tyrannosaurus, the Triceratops, Mastodon, Sabertooth Tiger, Pterodactyl, and the Dragon. Dragon Zord might be the coolest, because it can kind of operate on its own, not to mention it's just a sick-looking design. And then, of course, later there's also Titanus, who is, uh... He's cool. He's like a Brachiosaurus kind of thing. And that concept would be later on expanded in Dino Thunder with the Black Rangers Megazord. But here it's a bit underutilized, and while the Dino Ultra Zord thing looks cool... I don't know, Titanus feels a bit underutilized. He's super cool, though. 
And if you want to get a toy of him, um, good luck. Those things are like 700 bucks now, so. Yeah, that's the original six plus Titanus. Moving into season two, we had the lion, the firebird, the unicorn, the griffin, the dragon, and the tiger. Which is, some of these are interesting. Like, I don't know why they made the Blue Rangers Zord a unicorn. That, that just, that's just weird. But having a red dragon Zord is pretty cool. Not to mention, I think it'd kind of become a mainstay because I don't feel like it's the last time we see a red ranger use a dragon Zord, but it's still cool. And then, of course, there's Tiger Zord. And Tiger Zord's just cool. But yeah, they're pretty cool. And if, in case you're wondering which goes with which with Season 2, the Lions for the Black Ranger, Firebirds for Pink, Unicorns for Blue, Griffin is for Yellow, Dragon is for Red, and of course, Tiger is for White. And then moving on to Season 3, and also the Zords that would later be used again in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie, which I will talk about at the end of this video, don't worry. There's the Red Ape Zord, the Black Frog Zord, the Blue, uh, Blue Wolf Zord, Yellow Bear Zord, Pink Crane Zord, and of course the White Falcon Zord. And again, I feel like the White Ranger gets the coolest one. I mean, it's a freaking falcon. Moving on from that, let's talk about the Megazords and their many, many combinations. I'm only going to talk about in depth really the main lines, not really the alternate combinations, and I'm just going to mention those. So. Let's start off with the Dino Megazord. This is by far the most iconic of all of the Ranger Megazords. Like, it's, it's blocky, it's bulky, it's silly looking, but it's cool. And at the same time, while it is silly, it also somehow looks badass. So, yeah. Not to mention, it would be far from the last time we see this Megazord. As it would later return in Beast Morphers. I believe it returns again in uh, Super Mega Force. Yeah, I'm sorry. Some of these I'm having a bit of trouble remembering, but... Yeah, the Dino Megazord is by far the most iconic. And then, of course, next is the Thunder Megazord, which is... It's fine. It just looks a bit weird with that giant green sash thing over its chest. Like, that just looks weird, but... It still looks cool. It just looks a bit... Bulky for the sake of being bulky. And then there's the Ninja Falcon Megazord, which is, it's fine, but it's very stripped down. This is specifically the one used in the movie, so, yeah, that's why that one looks the way it does. Then the Ninja Megazord's pretty cool. It just has a little too much red for my liking. Like, you have red on the legs, you have red on one of the hands, and then red on the shoulder pads, red eyes, and the red stripe on the top of the head thing. So, yeah, that the Ninja Megazord's cool, but it's just way too red. But that's the four main ones. And then there's the Ninja Mega, the Ninja Ultra, and the Ninja Falcon, as well as the Ultra Zord, the Mega Dragon Zord, the Shogun Mega Falcon Zord, and the Shogun Ultra Zord. I'm pretty sure I got them all. Yeah. So yeah, that's all the Megazords. Moving on to the vehicles, which would be later become a staple of the franchise, but here they're kind of a bit of an afterthought because there's only two vehicles in the whole series. I know technically there's these other bikes, but they were never used in the actual show. They came from the Sentai, so they weren't in the actual Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, so yeah, there you go. I mentioned it. For the vehicles, you have the Rad Bug, which wouldn't return until the Netflix special, sadly, which is cool because it's like a... It's a flying Volkswagen. It's a flying Volkswagen Beetle that's stark white and is pretty cool for getting around places. Like, It's very underutilized, though. Like They use it in only a few episodes, and that's gone for good, which sucks because there are more than a few times that would have come in handy. And then, of course, there's the Shark Cycles, which are introduced in... Sorry, give me a minute. Uh, they're they're introduced around halfway through season three, so yeah, there's that. That's the vehicles. You only get two. Bit of a shame, but that would later become expanded upon in later seasons, so give it a bit of a pass. Then we have the weapons. 
And thankfully, this one's also pretty short and self-explanatory because you have the universal weapons, the combined weapons, and then the normal weapons themselves. So let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Starting with the uh, weapons that are unanimous to each ranger, first up is the Blade Blaster, which is interesting, to say the least, because it's a blaster, you can fold up, put in a holster, and then you can also have it as a blaster, as it, the name implies, or as the other uh, part of the name implies, it has a blade mode. It's interesting. It's a very strange and unique design. Then later on, when the Super Z putties end up coming into play, you get the Thunder Slingers. Um, they're fine, but they're no Blade Blaster. They just feel a bit too clunky. Then moving on from that, you have, of course, all the main weapons of each Ranger. Starting off, of course, with the most iconic one, the Power Sword, belonging to the Red Ranger. It's just a cool design, and it's a giant sword. What more do I need to say? Then the Black Ranger gets a Power Axe that can also double as a blaster, which is pretty cool. And I feel like may have been a bit of a inspiration for Ruby, who also has that kind of configuration with all their weapons in the show as well, so... Maybe I'm just talking out of my rear, but that's just what makes me think of. So, yeah, the Power Axe is pretty cool. It's personally one of my favorites of the of the power weapons. Then there's the Power Lance, which is wielded by the Blue Ranger. And what's cool about this one is it's kind of like a lightsaber, because you have, like, this giant staff with these ends on... these, like, spear-like ends on the points. And then you can also split it in two, and it can turn into two different weapons, which is interesting, because a lot like a lightsaber, you can either have like two lightsabers by themselves, or you can combine them together into a giant lightsaber staff double-bladed thing. Yeah, I know, I'm not a Power Ranger, I'm not Power Ranger that. I am not a Star Wars historian, so I don't know all that lore and crud, so. But that's just what that makes me think of. And I just think the Power Lance has an overall cool design. Then there's the Power Daggers, which belong to the Yellow Ranger. Uh, they're fine, they work for what they are, but they're not really that memorable. And then there's the Power Bow for the Pink Ranger, which might be one of my favorite ones, because, one, it's a bow and arrow. That's just cool in itself. And the white and pink color scheme really works with this weapon, and not to mention it is very overutilized in the show. So, yeah, I really like the Power Bow. I know that sounds stupid coming from a guy, but I really like the Power Bow. And of course, they combine into the Power Blaster, which is a giant thing they use to destroy the Monster of the Week pretty much every time, until Rita, of course, makes them grow with her staff, and they end up going into Megazord, and you know the whole shtick. But that would also become a thing that we would see become more prevalent throughout the series with the weapons combining. Like, for example... You have the Z-Rex Blaster in Dino Thunder, which is made of the Tyranno Staff, the Terra Grips, and the Tricera Shield, when they're all put together. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the Power Blaster. And then, for probably the coolest weapon in the entire show, and arguably one of the coolest in the entire series, the Dragon Dagger, wielded by the Green Ranger. Not only is it an awesome design with its pink and not pink, with its green and black color scheme with the gold buttons, but also because of its double utilization as both a weapon, as it should be, and also as a flute to summon and control the Dragon Zord. Like, the Green Ranger doesn't have to be in the Dragon Zord to control it, and he can just control it with this dagger. Like, that's really cool utilization and really cool design. And then, of course, there's the gold accents throughout the blade. It's just a sick, sick-looking weapon. Like, Seriously, the Dragon Dagger is awesome. I would put it right up there with Goku's Power Bowl. And then moving on from that is Saba, which would end up becoming the weapon of the White Ranger when they get their new powers. And Saba is not as cool as the Dragon Dagger, but it's not bad. Like, it's a giant white sword, and then the end of the hilt is a talking tiger head. And Saba can be pretty annoying sometimes, but... Yeah, Saba's still cool, he's just not as cool as the Dragon Dagger. I just feel like the Dragon Dagger is probably the best designed weapon out of the whole show. Then again, it's just my personal opinion, because I have a very 
severe bias towards Tommy when it, and all his weapons and costumes and stuff. He's just always been one of my favorite rangers. And then later on in the series, there's also the power cannon, which is like this giant black and gold bazooka thing that has like a dragon for a head. And it requires at least three rangers to actually, you know, work because it has to use their power. Um, it's fine, but there's a reason it doesn't really get brought up much anymore. Because it is a bit of a clunky weapon. Okay, we're over half an hour in, and now we're going to get into what I actually need to talk about <laughs> is the episodes that are essential to the series now when i say essential i mean the ones that move the plot forward or are just notable for some weird reason and out of the 150 plus episodes of this show i think of just mighty morphin because mighty morphin is the only one that has three seasons um only 40 of them are actually essential, and most of them are multi-parters, so, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. I'm just going to list them off, and then, it, most of these are pretty self-explanatory. I did put a little thing on here next to the name of the uh, episode to help remind me why it's essential, so, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? So, for the essential episodes, the ones you absolutely need to watch when you rewatch the show, or if you're watching it for the first time, these are the ones that you need to see. And, yeah, there's a lot of filler in this show, too. So, this is just to cut out all the filler. And if you want a more streamlined, essential guide to Mighty Morphin. First up, of course, is Day of the Dumpster. It's the series pilot. It's the first morph. It's the first team coming together. Like, it's the series pilot. You have to watch the pilot. Then moving on is Teamwork. Um, it's mostly a filler episode, but what's interesting about it is that it is the introduction of the Blade Blaster, so that's why it's somewhat significant. And then, of course, there's Green with Evil, the five-part miniseries, which is the introduction of Tommy, Tommy's villain arc as the Green Ranger, and then it ends with him becoming a good guy. Like, Green with Evil is probably the most iconic episode in the entire franchise, for very good reason. And Tommy was a really good villain too like trust me he's awesome as a villain and then he's even better when he becomes a good guy trust me green with evil is absolutely essential it's five parts but trust me all five parts are worth watching then you have gung-ho which is another filler episode but it has one big significant thing which is the intro of titanus who like i said is a bit underutilized but it's fine then you have Wheel of Misfortune, another one that's a bit of a filler episode, but it has the intro of the Ultra Zord. So, with that, it does end up becoming essential, even though it's mostly a filler episode. Then, of course, you have Green Candle Part 1 and 2, which, of course, is Tommy's departure from the series, which, yes, is only temporary, but it's still essential to the series. And it's the original end of the Green Ranger. Then there's Doomsday Part 1 and 2, which was originally intended to be the series finale. But it ended up becoming so popular that they just kept going. So, yeah. There's that return of an old friend. That's the uh, return of Tommy. But he, and then Z uh, Zordon uses some of his power to last the Green Ranger powers longer. But it is very temporary. And eventually it's going to run out. And then you have Oyster Stew, and that's the Season 1 finale. Not really much more to say there. Moving on to Season 2, you have Mutiny Part 1 through 3. This is the intro of Lord Zed and the Thunder Zords. Then you have Green Dream, which is the start of the end of the Green Ranger. Like, the real, definitive end of the Green Ranger, when his powers start fading for good, even after Zordon tries to help. And then Green No More, of course, is the Green Ranger's final episode. Missing Green, this is when they try to do the candle thing again, but this time with all the with the, all the other rangers kidnapped, and they try to do the same thing. Thankfully, Tommy comes in and saves them. So, yeah, there's, there's that. And also, what's interesting about Missing Green is that there's also a bit of guilt from Jason from being unable to stop the green candle from burning out the green ranger powers. So, yeah, it, it's a very dramatic episode, but it works really well, trust me. Then moving on from that is White Light Part 1 and 2. This is the introduction of the Red Ranger and when Tommy becomes a full member of the team again. 
Then, of course, there's Ninja Encounter Part 1 through 3, which is our introduction to who would later become the new Red, Black, and Yellow Ranger, Rocky, Adam, and Aisha. And yeah, they really, they really dragged this out. And then there's Power Transfer, which solidifies the cash shift, and it is the introduction of Serpentera. Then you have The Wedding, Part 1 through 3. It's self-explanatory. It's the episode where Rita and Zed get married after Zed brainwashes her, and then later Zed... Well, when Zed even gets an antidote, it still turns out that he does actually love Rita, so... Yeah. Then you have Best Man for the Job, um... Filler episode, but in my opinion, the funniest episode. Like, that was just a lot of fun. And then Blue Ranger Gone Bad is the season 2 finale when Billy turns evil, temporarily due to mind control, but it's still cool. Then moving on to season 3... Of course, the big one is Ninja Quest. This is the introduction of Rito. This is the destruction of the old Zords. It's the introduction of Ninjor. And of course, the introduction of the new Ninja Powers. It's a four-parter, but it's a very good four-parter. That would later end up being reused in the movie to some extent. Then there's a Ranger Catastrophe. This is the introduction of Kat to the series. And like I said, Kat, just like Tommy, starts out as a villain. And then Changing of the Zords. This one has the highest stakes of the entire show up to that point. Then there's Follow That Cab, which is kind of a filler episode, but it has more of Cat's backstory, and it's the introduction of the Shark Cycles. And then there's Different Shade of Pink, which is the cast shift from Kimberly to Cat when Kim says goodbye, and she gets a really good send-off, too. Like, probably the most respectful send off of any character in the whole series. And then you have the last of the mini series in the show, which is Master Vile and the Metallic Armor. It's one of the only times we get to see Master Vile, unfortunately, and he's very cool, but he does some very weird things, but it's the last mini series of the show, so it's worth watching. And then there's Rangers in Reverse, which leads directly into Alien Rangers, which turns into the Mighty Morphin series finale, so... Yeah, I know, that's a mouthful, but... Okay, I talked about all the essential stuff, now it's my overall opinion of Mighty Morphin. It's one of those things where it is the first, but it's far from the best. Like, Season 1 does have that nice nostalgia feel to it, and sure it's low budget, sure you can tell it's a lot of reused Super Sentai stock footage, but it's still a lot of fun, it's still pretty lighthearted and mostly pretty campy. And, of course, Green with Evil just makes the whole thing worth it. I love that miniseries so much. And then Season 2 is a bit of a... bit of a cluster screw. Like, I'm not going to say the actual word because it's a kid-friendly channel. But, um... It has good episodes in there, but it just feels like sometimes they really didn't know what to do. And apparently there was some uh, stuff going on behind the scenes, not just with the Rangers having the... Uh, the cast ship because of pay disputes. But also just because apparently the production was rushed and it was very bizarre. And not to mention, like I said, it took forever to actually get the cast shift in integrated into the show. So, yeah. Season 2 is okay, but it just feels like they were trying to do too much at once. And then season three is the strongest of the entire se uh, this entire series, in my opinion. Uh, Ninja Quest alone makes it worth it. And then, of course, you have Ranger Catastrophe and Different Shade of Pink. And, of course, Rangers in Reverse that leads directly into Alien Rangers. So. Season three is when they started finding their footing and figured out how to write the show, how to write the show, how the show should be made and produced. And stuff like that, so. Season 1 is definitely rough around the edges, but still pretty good and very entertaining. Season 2 is okay, but it doesn't really... It just feels too jumbled up, and they're trying to do too many things at once. And then with Season 3, it's by far the strongest one, where they finally find their footing, finally find out how to write the series correctly, and it feels a bit more well-paced than the others. So. Yeah. That's my overall thoughts on Mighty Morphin Power Rangers as the main three seasons. Uh, if I had to give each one a score and then the overall score of the season, of the entire series itself, 
I'd say season one is probably a strong seven because it does it does what it needs to do. It's rough around the edges. You can definitely tell it's low budget and it has its very cheesy moments, but it works well as a first season, even though arguably it is very much very by Green with Evil. Like if that wasn't there, I'd probably drop down to a six. But yeah, I still have a lot of fond memories and love for Mighty Morphin. And while I, unfortunately, being a 2000s kid, didn't get to grow up with it, when I saw it, I still had a great time. I still had a good time watching it. So yeah, I'd give a strong 7 to Season 1. Uh, season 2 is a 5. Like I said, it's just fine. It just feels way too clustered. They were trying to do too many things at once. And then the behind-the-scenes stuff just made it all worse. So Season 2 is fine, but outside the essential episodes, I'd just skip it. And then moving on to Season 3, Season 3, I'd probably give, um, I'd give an 8. I'm going to give Season 3 an 8. I think it is a great season, and it's a pretty strong one to end the main series on. Even though, again, technically the mainline series finale is in Alien Rangers with that final two-parter, which I'll talk more about tomorrow. But putting all that into account... I'd say that the first season of the show probably averages to about, probably around a 7 out of 10 altogether. Like, it's weighed down a lot by season 2 being such a cluster screw, but season 1's pretty strong, and season 3 is just excellent. Like, love season 3. One of the strongest seasons in the entire show, in my opinion. And while there's definitely going to be much better coming down the pipeline, it's still very good and worth re- and worth rewatching. But like I said, it's weighed down a lot by season two, and not to mention each season has their fair share of useless filler. So, yeah. All those things kind of weigh it down, but it's still good. I still think it's a very good start to what becomes a much better franchise later on, for better and for worse. Okay. Now let's stop being around the bush and talk about the movie. Um... I didn't watch the movie for the longest time. It's not that I didn't have any interest in it. I couldn't really find a way to watch it. And then I found this. And I gave it a watch. Not to mention I did watch the Nostalgia Critic review of this movie before I got to see it myself. So I went into it thinking like, oh no, this is going to suck. I'm going to have a bad time with it and I'm going to agree with it. And kind of, I'll explain. So let's start with the cast. Of course, the main rangers are here from season three, you have Kat, Aisha, Adam, Billy, Rocky, and Tommy. And then the supporting cast is Zordon, Alpha, Bulk, Skull, and Mr. Kelman. There's also that kid, but he doesn't really do much, so not really worth mentioning. And then we get to the villains. Of course, you have Rita and Lord Zed returning. That much doesn't surprise me. But the big surprise here is the original villain that ends up not really becoming integrated into the main series. And that is Ivan Ooze. Now, a lot of people call Ivan Ooze one of the worst villains in the series. And I can kind of see why, but at the same time, he does do some pretty good stuff. He destroys the command center. He almost kills Zordon. And not to mention, he takes away the ranger's powers. So, not to mention, he enslaves humanity to do his evil bedding. And then he has a plan to destroy the Earth. And he's pretty strong. And his design is interesting, to say the very least. Like... Is it here? Yes. Back. Back this thing. Very interesting design that fits with Power Rangers. And Paul Freeman does a good job acting in this role. And yes, it's that Paul Freeman, the one you're thinking of. So. Yeah. I think Ivan News is a pretty decent villain. I'll go more into that when I get to the pros of the movie, but yeah, that's that. And then there's the Oozlings, which are the foot soldiers of this movie, replacing the Tengas. Um, they're fine. But they're not really that significant or interesting, so I don't really think they need to be elaborated on. Okay, let's jump into the plot synopsis. A giant egg is unearthed at an Angel Grove construction site and soon opens, releasing the terrible villain Ivan Ooze, who wreaks vengeance on Zordon for imprisoning him millennia ago. With Zordon dying and their powers lost, the rangers head to a faraway planet to find a new power and stop Ivan Ooze from destroying the Earth. Uh, that, that premise seems fine, pretty standard for Power Rangers, but it's fine. Alright, let's get into the pros of the movie. 
Starting off, um, much improved Ranger suits. They had a higher budget for this one. You can pretty much clearly tell. As they put more production into it, there's a bit more design into it. And the Ranger suits, in my opinion, are much more improved from the show. They have, like, they try to do that metallic thing, kind of like what they were doing in the show, but it's not glitter, it's actual armor, and it looks really cool. And yes, it looks a bit bulky, but it looks really, really cool on screen. Um, there's some pretty cool fight scenes in this movie, especially the first one in the city, before Ivanus gets released. It's a really cool first fight, and not to mention it has a really good soundtrack to it, which I'll get to later. And there's some nice choreography, there's some cool cinematography. It's just really cool. It's a, it, There's some pretty cool fight scenes in this movie when they go hand-to-hand. -hand. And then, like I said, the cinematography is pretty good, and the choreography of the fighting is also pretty good. And uh, I'm going to argue with you guys on this. This has the best version of the MMPR theme song. I will fight you on this. <laughs> um, not that the original one was bad by any means, but this, the, this movie version, done by a band called Megadeth, just feels so much more epic in its scale and its scope. Like, and not to mention the kicking drums, the up, the more up-tempo beat, and that epic finale that thankfully is copyright-free so I can use it in the intro of all these videos because, oh man, I get goosebumps every time I listen to this song. It's so good. I will listen to this version a thousand times over. I love, love this version of the theme song. That may be controversial, but that's my opinion, and I think it's awesome. So yeah, the best version of the MMPR theme song, and I will fight you on this. The directing's good, it's competent, there's no shaky cam or any of that nonsense. Uh, the concepts are pretty interesting here, like having Ivan Ooze being able to enslave humanity to do his bidding, which will later end up being reused in some of the later seasons, but it's still okay here, and it does well for the plot. And like I said, there's a mostly much higher budget here, as you can tell from the set design and just the overall scope of everything. And, like I said, Ivan News is a decent villain. Like, he's not the best villain of Power Rangers. He's not better than Lord Zed. He's not better than Rita. But he does do some pretty effective things throughout the movie in its runtime. And not to mention Paul Freeman's acting being hammy, just like the other villains. It works, and it just gets me smiling. I really like Ivan News. I don't get why people hate him so much. And like I said, the acting is overall okay. I mean, you still have the Season 3 cast here who are all doing pretty good jobs. You still have some of the supporting characters from that. You have Zordon, Alpha, Bulk, and Skull, which are, they're all top tier as usual. And even some of the side characters are mostly fine. Like, there's not really any actors here that just make me roll my eyes and groan, which is much appreciated. Okay, now let's get to the cons of the movie, which sadly is it's everything else. Um, the pacing is bad, the writing is clunky, the story is an absolute mess, and not to mention there's a far worse rehash of what's later of what was already done in Ninja Quest. The CGI is absolutely freaking abysmal. Like it is it is disgusting, it is ugly, it is awful. Oh, I hate the CGI in this movie. Like, seriously, the CGI in this movie sucks. I think that's the one thing all of us can agree on. The final battle with Ivan Ooze is a huge disappointment because it's just a big CGI clunk fest, and then uh, the villain's defeated by a knee in the crotch, which would later become reused in the Mighty Morphin 2017 movie. Why? And then, yeah, the CGI is just awful. It is... The CGI just really ruins it. And then the ending is just flat out crap. I'm not going to say why. You'll just understand why when you see it for yourself. So, going into my final thoughts on this movie overall. Um, it's fine. It's decent. I've definitely seen worse TV related movies. But it's definitely no masterpiece. I can see why it didn't do so hot at the box office. And... While it is mostly pretty fondly remembered by the fans, everyone else just kind of, like, hates it. Especially Nostalgia Critic, who absolutely ripped it apart. And, yeah, I can see why, because all the fundamentals of a good movie are not here, but it's made up for in just all the Ranger stuff you get here. So, 
Yeah, my final verdict for the uh, Power Rangers movie is a six. It's a fun watch for the fans, but for everyone else, it's a one and done kind of thing. And if you just don't like Power Rangers at all, just don't bother. It's not gonna convince you to try it otherwise. So, yeah, it's worth watching for fans for the excellent Mega Death theme song, and it's higher budget and it's great fight choreography. But otherwise, it's one and done at best. All right, and that concludes almost this one hour long video on just Mighty Morphin. Um, th there was a lot to get through here, so I had to give it this huge runtime. And there's not really much graphics in this one either because it's going to take forever in the editor. But I did put the scores on the screen, at least I hope they did. Thank you, Mr. Editor, aka Future Me. But I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this long video despite all my talking and rambling. And I hope I kind of helped you guys expand your knowledge a bit on Power Rangers. And I just really hope you enjoy this video. And like I said, we have an entire month of this. And like I said, it's going to be much, much shorter from here on out. Because each one is either like one season or one season split into two seasons. Stuff like that. There's no th three seasons again. And we don't have to talk about another movie again until Turbo. And that's going to be a lot easier because Turbo's only one season. So, yeah. This just goes to show you how successful and popular Mighty Morphin alone was and how it pretty much established everything that the franchise would become mainstays for going forward. But yeah, that concludes my thoughts on Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you guys tomorrow when we conclude Mighty Morphin with the Alien Rangers. Peace. Oh, shoot. I forgot to talk about the Netflix special. Okay. It's garbage. It is a terrible anniversary special. I mean, it's a terrible character. And it feels like an absolute disgrace and disservice to everything good about Mighty Morphin. That's really all I have to say about it. It's a 3 out of 10. It's a piece of crap. Don't bother watching it. That's all I got. Thanks for watching. See you, Alien Rangers. Bye.